Shiner, man, thanks for joining me back to do this and share a few more stories. So happy to have you back on the podcast. Thanks, Rain. Happy to be here. Well, if you wouldn't mind, I know you got a couple stories, and this is the There I Was segment, so kind of short stories that are told in the bar or the backyard barbecue, just depending on the environment and scenario. But I know you got a few, and if you wouldn't mind, just indulge us and share a little bit of a There I Was. Sure. Yeah, so there I was. We uh, transit down to Red Rio from Kirtland to go shoot our weapons at the FTU. And have you flown down at Red Rio as a Viper guy? No, I've, I've flown probably over it at 40,000 feet, so <laughs> that's about it. The, the Holloman F-16s shoot down there too or drop down there. Um, so we'll swap airspace with those guys periodically. But we were doing a, it was two IPs, so two instructor pilots up front in the Paypock, and we flew down to Holloman. So we're very heavy with double loads of ammo because we can swap out on the ground and reload after we shoot once for our new SMAs, Special Mission Aviators, getting them trained to shoot. So we fly down there and it's a high, hot, heavy flight in summer, I think, in New Mexico. So, so hot, heavy aircraft. We probably don't have single engine airspeed range on takeoff. So we, I kind of picked an EP of the day that was a power loss of some sort and talked through what would happen. Pretty standard. And we go down there and I'm flying with a, a buddy in the other seat and he's bored out of his mind. So he wants to fly super slow so we can just shoot out both sides of the aircraft to just get them through the mechanics of shooting the GAU-2 in this case the minigun. And I keep looking at our bucket airspeed, which is our single engine airspeed, which we have now, but it's, it's like a five knot range or something. And I'm like, Hey, is speed that, up a little. Yeah, go ahead. So, so for being a guy who only had one engine now, <laughs> right. engines, the single engine airspeed in a helicopter, I assume that speed is the min speed you need to continue flying or safely land. If you lose a motor, is that true? That is true, except for the safely land part. That's probably <laughs> what the that's hell probably is that out. <laughs> right. Uh, we could land like an airplane. So if we can find a runway, we can go land on the runway. Uh, but we can't hover anymore. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. And again, I mean, I, I know just blanket like safe with air quotes with a helicopter. It's violently shaking itself apart. So sorry to interrupt, but I just I had to know what that yeah. was and. Being, you know, a fixed so the, the COA is if you're too heavy and you lose an engine, you dump your fuel. Or in like an Apache's case, you can jettison your external stores. And okay. so you just make the aircraft lighter. Or, or have your least favorite crew member bring a parachute <laughs> out, uh, a base jumping shoot or something. Um, so we talked through that, but we're at the range now where we just have a narrow band. And it's night run MVGs where we can fly. But we'd also briefed an LZ in the middle of this impact area where we could land if we lost an engine. We marked it with a chem stick. So we kind of knew where that was. And I'm wanting to kind of shack L over D max, lift over drag max, which is that single engine speed range. And uh, my buddy just wants to get it over with by going slow so they can shoot all on one pass kind of. And uh, and we're kind of going back and forth. And then I look through the center of the cockpit and I see two indications that are independent that our engine oil pressure on one of the engines is just like master caution on instantly dropping. And it's, if you see two of these, it's pretty certain that it's happening versus uh, maybe a bad indicator or whatever. Gotcha. And so I look over to my side and we're a beam the chem stick and with a tailwind to where we wanted to land. So we can just do a right 180 helicopter flying, kind of bleed the airspeed off, but fall into uh, ETL and just ride effective translational lift where your tail rotor is still effective, but the right aerodynamic energy management state to land this thing it, with this decaying engine that's still working fine. So I figure, hey, we, we have a minute or two of this thing working okay. So instead of being committed to kind of this box canyon area with one engine, narrow airspeed range at night, dumping gas, and then flying to an unfamiliar airfield, which would have been Holloman probably, and doing a, a roll on 
or an airplane landing there, uh, you know, I can just land it and mitigate all that risk by just getting it on the ground with two good engines with a normal approach. And I think, man, this is awesome. I briefed this. It's right next to us. This is perfect. So I just, you know, uh, pilot's got controls and he transfers them. Our CRM was really good. Turn around, get on the approach. And as we're short final, I'm like, hey, guys, we're losing the, I think it was the number two engine, low oil pressure. So they would understand what I was doing. And they're safe in the weapons. We get to the ground. We set down and uh, look at the indications, shut that engine down with the checklist. And I think they went up there and they're like, yeah, it's bone dry, oil pressure wise. We were like, wow, man, that was kind of a good idea, right? To just land it. And we look out. And less than a football field from our helicopter is this rolling grass fire that we had started with our mini guns. <laughs> classic. <laughs> it is a classic helicopter problem, right? Um, <laughs> everything's trying to kill you all the time. And so we get this beast on the ground and now we have one engine that's shut down that works. And we have some fire bottles on the aircraft for the helicopter but they're for like an aircraft fire. Right. <laughs> have, um, two uh, SMAs in back, the instructor, special mission aviators. And, and they volunteer to go out there with the fire extinguishers. And I say, all right, yeah, go see if you can put this out. And so they go out there, takes forever. It's dark. You're like half on MBGs walking out there. So they go out there, they try to put it out. They come back and, uh, one of these guys is um, one of our classic like muscle men smas and like his calves chafe as he walks basically. So he like, <laughs> barely hikes back to the aircraft with his, um, with the empty fire bottle now. And he's like, hey, uh, yeah, it had no effect on it at all. <laughs> and, and now the fire is like head height and the winds are variable. So it's like uncertain how close it's gonna get to us, but it is definitely getting closer. And so uh, my buddy and I talk and he's like, yeah, you know, we'll just start this engine and taxi it like three wheel taxi through the desert away from it. But it's, it's really <laughs> uneven terrain and it's, uh, it's a good idea, but it's like a desperate idea. Um, so we get on the radio with range control and we're like, surely they have crash fire rescue or something that can help us here. So I'm, I'm standing out of the side of the cockpit with my helmet on, on the radio and I'm talking to them. They're like, oh, no, sorry, sir. We can't come there because there's a bunch of UXOs. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's great. Because they're, they're listening yeah, to the unexploded uh, ordinance. <laughs> right. Unexploded ordinance. But we have this LZ surveyed and we're pretty confident it's, it's safe. Uh, but as I hear him saying that, I look at my foot and I'm standing on a 203 grenade that oh. somehow is there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess there are UXOs here. Okay. Um, and so I like move my foot and climb back in and, you know, through some fate, our, our really good flight doc was on board for this flight to get his flight pay. And the fire now dies down briefly with the gusts of wind. And I, I say, Hey doc, do you want to go out there with me and find some rocks and just see if we can put this out like digging? <laughs> and so the doc and I go out there and just like put out 30 yards of knee high forest brush fire with a like shale rock. And in the best part is we were in a dual squadron with Hueys and Pavehawks. And so our squadron commander comes and rescues us in a Huey, the, <laughs> the venerable, reliable war horse and uh, rescues us and gets us out of there. <laughs> that is amazing. And I think that's so true. Everything is trying to kill you in a helicopter. Like that's the epitome <laughs> of it. I have one, you know, kind of piggyback on that story, a fire story. Yeah. I was a demo at, at Shaw, right? So the whole airfield, everything is sterile for three miles. There's nothing going on. No one can move inside the airfield. Um, and I'm flying about halfway through, like I'm like rolling and I see like a fire down in between the runways. And I'm like, that's kind of odd. And I was like, maybe like, a, you know, some underground cable caught on fire and there's like a housing there that you just never see. And I was like do another pass another mover i'm like the fire's getting bigger and then finally we just like all right we knock it off land fire trucks go out there and they put out this like huge fire well it turns out like the motor was spitting out molten metal 
um, at some point during the demo. And I guess it was probably on the takeoff because that's like the lowest. And apparently this happens from time to time. You're just never low <laughs> enough where it's like that hot and hits the ground. So it wasn't quite as exciting as yours and then standing on a two or three grenade. But, you know, I mean, we've all been there. We've all caught something on fire. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, when something catches fire, you don't want to think it's happening, right? And you want to pretend like something else is going on. But that's why the checklist exists, right? To like do the do something that makes sense. What was the time from when you noticed the issue to when you're on the ground? Just for the audience, probably story. like 45 seconds. Yeah, that's why I elected to keep it. Uh, so we talk in the Hilo. If you can make an air emergency a ground emergency it's usually a, a good course of action because we can, anywhere is our runway, right? In most cases, unless you're over the water and then it's a whole nother um, game. And so that's why I did that. But I, you know, you brief the fire danger at the range. So it should have been in my cross check, but it, it was not. Also the fire on the ground in my MVG should have been in my cross check, but it was not. I would imagine too, if you guys are out there shooting, like the fire condition obviously allowed for mini guns and probably, I mean, I know there's sometimes limitation for the 50 cal or whatever it might be, but obviously that day it was good. It just, the right conditions existed in that spot to stoke up a fire. Right. And it's just a bunch of sagebrush. So it's not going to hopefully be, there's fire break roads, right? But there, we were within the fire break roads. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be some crap man you like put it down and then your helicopter burns up because you start I know there. yeah I was I was pretty sure we were going to be okay we would just have to like hike away from it and watch it burn <laughs> which is a terrible outcome um <laughs> but to like, hear the firefighters be like oh no we can't help you because it's really dangerous to be there oh, uh, okay. that's awesome well, Schneider thanks for sharing that story man yeah you're welcome that's entertaining <laughs> <laughs>